Good morning, everyone. I'm Natalie McKnight. I'm the Dean of the College of General Studies, and we're going to get started here in about two or three minutes. We just need to give people some time to, to file in to the webinar. So, so hang tight or get yourself a cup of coffee or another beverage, and we'll be right back at about 9.02. So see you in a minute. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm Natalie McKnight. I'm the Dean of the College of General Studies and welcome to this question and answer webinar. I wanted to start out by um, both welcoming you and then congratulating you on your acceptance to Boston University. Uh, it's never been a more competitive year. Uh, we accepted less than 19% um, of the people who applied, that's incredibly competitive, and we had over 75,000 applications. So your acceptance is an enormous accomplishment and, and you should be patting yourselves on your back uh, if you can do that. So our purpose here today is just to give you a good sense of the, the key attributes of the College of General Studies and how it fits into a four-year degree at Boston University. Uh, of course, we want to answer your questions, which we'll do in a Q&A session at the end of this brief presentation. And, and we hope we can take some of the stress out of this uh, whole process, uh, because I, we all realize it's a very stressful process. Uh, I've been through it myself as a parent and been through it many years as a professor and as an as a administrator. And so I know it, it, can, be, uh, it can take its toll on your nerves, but, but we want to assure you that um, you've, you've gotten through the hardest part, right? You got into a great school. You probably got into other great schools too, and now you're just shopping around. So, so enjoy that and, and we'll try to make it enjoyable for you as well. So after this brief presentation, we'll just go to the Q&A. And if you've never done a webinar before, if you hover your cursor around the bottom of your screen, you should see just a little section with Q&A on it. You click on that, you type in your question, and we have a great panelist, a, a series of panelists with us today who can help me answer uh, your questions. So that's how we're gonna do that. And let me just get started with some, some nuts and bolts about Boston University. So, so BU's large, we're the fourth largest private university uh, in the US. We have about 34,000 students total, uh, about 16,000 undergraduates, 16 schools and colleges, and over 300,000 living alumni. I wanna pause on that fact for a second because that's an amazing network to draw from. Our alumni tend to be fiercely loyal to CGS and to BU. They love to mentor and hire fellow Terriers. And that is a great resource to tap into when you're looking for internships, jobs, et cetera. So, so keep that in mind. We're also a research university, which means our faculty are not just staying on top of the knowledge in their fields because they, they are doing that and sharing that knowledge with students in a classroom but they're also adding to knowledge in their fields. They are creating knowledge, pushing out the boundaries of knowledge in, in every field that you can imagine. So that's a very exciting atmosphere to be part of. And uh, our faculty are an amazing group of people, award winners, Nobel Pulitzer, National Book Award win winners, Guggenheim and Fulbright Scholars, et cetera. And these are the folks 
that are teaching our students and working with them on undergraduate research projects, et cetera. We're also internationally renowned. We're ranked number seven among top US colleges for international students, ranked number 27 for most innovative schools. And I think that's another good fact to pause on for a second because innovation is where it's at right now. Everyone is looking to be innovative and BU is incredibly innovative in its courses, its programs, its research, et cetera. And we're ranked number 14 for most employable graduates. Another great fact to pause on for a second because everybody wants to know that when they graduate, they can be hired and, and our graduates get hired very readily worldwide. Well, I've already said how competitive we were, so I won't repeat that, but uh, uh, let me just say a few words about CGS in general, and then we'll drill down into some specifics about it. College of General Studies is one of the oldest and most respected general education programs in the country. Uh, we are looked at as, as a leader in general education both nationally and internationally. And I'm going to share with you some reasons why I think that's the case. Um, one of the things we like to say about ourselves is like we're like a small private liberal arts college within a large research university. So you get the best of both worlds. You get that tight, close knit community of a small private liberal arts college, but you get all those resources of a major research one university in a great city. So to to kind of give you a sense of, of the specifics of CGS that make it very unique and very impactful, I thought I'd give you a, a top five list. And if you're interested in a top 10 list, we have a recording of me doing a top 10 presentation uh, on the admitted students website. So you can check that out if you want more. But today, top five, so, so we can leave some more time for your questions. Let's start with number five, a gap semester. So much research has shown that a gap semester really aids students in terms of giving them a bit of a break from full-time academic work before they start their college career. And we have found again and again that students start in January after the gap semester in the fall, really raring to go, jumping right in, getting involved, eager to get back into the classroom. That's not always the case with students who start in September. Many of them are kind of burned out after going back to school uh, from, for K, from K through 12, you know, 13 years, every year of September, they're going back to school. But our students take that gap in the fall and then they start in January. And that gives them an opportunity to do an internship, maybe do some traveling, work, save up some money, take a course or two toward their major, do some creative project, and then start in January, again, kind of fresh and, 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 and raring to go in, into the academic scene. Um, so we have found that many of our students after their, their uh, freshman year have already accomplished many of the things that some students wouldn't have accomplished for a couple years into their career. And I'll say more about that in a second. And none of the, another of the really distinguishing characteristics of CGS is that we have a team system. Uh, so we bring students in and we put them on a team of about 80 to 90 students who share the same faculty for the fall semester, sorry, sorry for the spring semester and the summer semester. And, um, and this is a great unit that is both socially and intellectually cohesive. Because the students are sharing some classes together, and sharing the same faculty for two semesters in a row, they really get to know one another and they get to know the faculty well and the faculty get to know them well. Students are able to uh, do group projects together, to study study groups together, et cetera, et cetera. And we have this a similar team system in the sophomore year. It's also intellectually impactful because since the same group of faculty are sharing the same students for two semesters, in the freshman year, that's spring and summer. And in the sophomore year, it's fall and spring. And, and they get to know those students really well. They can also be making connections among their courses, which really just doesn't happen anywhere else in the country. So that team of faculty with a professional advisor who's assigned to that uh, group of faculty, they meet once a week to talk about the students and who could use an, an extra challenge or who could use a little extra help. They also discuss what's happening in each of their classes so that they can make interdisciplinary connections with what they're teaching. And this really helps students hold on to what they're learning. So let's say they're talking about World War I in their social science course. In humanities, I might talk about World War I poets and World War I films. 
And in rhetoric, which is a writing argumentation course, they might look at World War I propaganda posters and how they persuaded people to enlist in a war that was decimating a whole generation. So when you study a topic like World War I or uh, changes in all disciplines at the turn of the century, you, when you study it from these multidisciplinary angles, it gives your brain a structure to hold on to the knowledge. And that structure enables you to remember it and to use that knowledge moving forward. It also teaches students that this is the way you learn best. So that anytime they approach a new topic or they're trying to solve a problem, they've, they learn that the best way to do that is from an interdisciplinary perspective, to pull from knowledge and voices perspectives from different disciplines. So this, this uh, interdisciplinary team system also enables students to get better letters of recommendation because faculty really get to know them well. It enables them to do their interdisciplinary capstone project in their sophomore year as well, which is a real world problem solving project, which I think really prepares students to take their academic knowledge out into the world and solve some of the real world problems that, that we're all facing right now. So number three in our top five list, Experiential learning. Our program is built on experiential learning, which means in addition to having classes, discussions, lectures, labs, etc., we take students out into the field to historic sites, to cultural sites, to musical performances, play performances, uh, etc. And that is part of the curriculum. And those ex those experiences, those opportunities, really help cement the learning in the courses. So many studies have shown that. You never really complete the learning cycle until you do something physical attached to all that abstract knowledge. And then when you do, it really gels that learning. So that's what we do. We, we, you know, we read, we, we study, we discuss, we lecture. Of course we do all that. But then we also have these physical experiences that really help the students bring that knowledge together. We also have one-on-one -on -one experiential learning too with our undergraduate research projects. Here you see one of our former undergraduates doing um, a lab research project with, with a professor, Sandy Berger, um, uh, looking at different um, options for antibiotics. So we offer about 50 of those paid undergraduate research projects a year. And that's another way in which we extend the experiential learning of our program. Second, Number two on our top five list is that you have an opportunity to study abroad in your first year of college. And many programs do not offer that. In most programs, uh, study abroad usually happens in the junior or even senior year. Here, you could do it in your freshman year. And uh, about 95% of our students, when there isn't a pandemic, study, do their second semester of their freshman year in a summer semester in London. It's wonderful. They do a lot of that experiential learning in and around London. And, uh, and use that as a, a way of um, kind of fleshing out the curriculum that they're learning in their classes there as well. We also have a Boston New England program and so that students who do not wanna to go to London and some don't uh, can stay here in Boston and explore New England instead of England. But when you think about it, remember I said during the gap semester, some people do internships, some people do um, travel, some people do service learning, some people take some courses. We have some students who've done all of the above somehow. So at the end of their freshman year, they've completed all the credits they need for uh, freshman year to continue into the sophomore year. They've done an internship. They've done a couple courses towards their major. They've done a big hunk of their general education requirements at BU. And then they've done an abroad program. That's a pretty impressive uh, first year at, at the university. And that leaves me with the top reason why um, CGS is really distinctive and may be the right college for you. We offer a really stimulating interdisciplinary curriculum that encourages faculty and students to make these connections among their courses and to think in an interdisciplinary fashion, as I was uh, talking about when I was describing the team system. The curriculum has also been designed by all the faculty to address the question, what should an educated adult know and be able to do? And I think that this is not something that higher education programs are doing enough. We want our students to go out and not have embarrassing gaps in their knowledge. And we are constantly tweaking our curriculum so that we feel that it is as comprehensive as a general education program could be and up to date 
and best prepares our students to go into the world uh, into a variety of different disciplines and, and uh, a myriad of different professions. Our program, <clears throat> excuse me, also fulfills most of BU's hub requirements and hub is the general education program that all BU students have to fulfill. And our program is very effective at doing that and very efficient because every single course in our program takes care of three hub requirements, the maximum a course can cover. So we take care of most of the general education requirements of, of students uh, while they are also working towards their major while they're with us. So I'm gonna share a slide with you that shows year one in our program. And you'll see in semester one, uh, students are taking social science, humanities, rhetoric in each of these boxes. Um, you can see these are the hub requirements that these courses take care of, three hub requirements each. And in the second semester, this is the London semester, or if you stay in New England, it's the Boston, New England semester. They again have social science, humanities, and rhetoric. In that first semester, in addition to the three CGS courses, they'll have, uh, they also have an elective toward their major. Uh, some students may have placed out of one of these and they might have two electives. In that six week summer semester, there's not enough time for an uh, elective. So they don't have an elective in that semester, but in the second year, year two, there is at least one elective each semester and many students will have two electives in at least uh, one of those semesters. So in the second year, it's social science, humanities, and uh, natural science in both semesters with at least one elective, but our students are allowed to um, opt out of one humanities and one social science course in our four semester sequence. So that opens up an el another elective possibility too. So the point is, our students are getting a lot of hub credits, which all BU students have to fulfill. They're getting a lot of them, taken care of in our program, while also taking electives towards their major, so that at the end of two years, they have all of the credits they need, many of the hub requirements they need, and multiple courses towards the major that they need as well. So they're not behind in any way. And then in their junior year, they just transition seamlessly into the college of their major, not behind, having already taken several courses towards the major, and well ahead of most students in terms of fulfilling hub requirements. So I know there's a lot going on in this slide and I'm not gonna walk you through every detail of it, but I have it up here and, and another one too, just to show you that we've worked out pathways from CGS to every major that there is at Boston University. This happens to be a pathway from CGS to Question School of Business. And it shows you in semester one, um, which would be the gap semester for our freshmen, what you might wanna take externally. And in your first semester, what you would take with us and what you might take uh, at CAS, College of Arts and Sciences, uh, as, as your elective. And then um, what you would take in your sophomore year, both at CGS and then at Questrom, and then in your junior and senior year. And we've done this for um, all majors. And all of these pathways are on our website, so you can check them out. I know a lot of you are interested in being pre-med, and we have a pre-med student on our panel today. So and she's, she's wonderful at answering questions about this. But if you were pre-med, you, you might be a bio major. And this would be the sequence of courses you might take if you start with us so that you can complete uh, your bio major in four years. The idea is you can complete any of these majors starting at CGS in four years, because that's what we're designed to do. All right. Um, the other thing that's wonderful about our curriculum is that in addition to all of those other things I said, is that we've designed our curriculum to really hone the kind of skills that employers are looking for. So there've been many, many surveys done of employers globally over the last 15 years or so. And they're asked, what are you looking for when you hire somebody? And the fact is, is that most, most employers are looking for these kind of broad based skills that are what we focus on in our program. Only about 18% of employers say they're looking for specific knowledge in a discipline. Why? Because they realize that a lot of that specific knowledge is going to have to be learned on the job because every job is, is very unique and has its own unique culture. So what they really want are people who are good communicators, good problem solvers, good collaborators. And those are the skills that we are really honing 
uh, in, in addition to this broad basis of knowledge in our program. But of course, we aren't here just to help you get a good job, although that's significant and important. We're also here to help you build a life, like a really rich, pur purposeful, uh, engaging, great life. And we hope we get to share that life with you. Thank you for listening. And it's time to do our questions. So I am going to um, stop sharing my screen so I can see our wonderful panelists and have them introduce themselves. So panelists, if you wanna uh, un unmute at this point, um, I'm going to start with uh, Associate Dean Stacy Godnick. And just introduce yourself, say a few words about what you do, where you're from. Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Stacy Godnick. I'm the Associate Dean for Student Academic Life at the College of General Studies. I've been at the university for 33 years. I originally uh, come from uh, New Jersey, Princeton, New Jersey. And uh, my responsibilities at the college is I oversee the uh, academic advising uh, crew, um, professional advisors who will be working with, uh, will working with your students one-on-one -on -one for the two years at CGS. And academic advising, as you will see, is a critical component of your experience at, at BU. Great, thank you, Stacy. And, and one of those advisors that works with Stacy is Matt Bay. Everybody, my name is Matt. Uh, I'm, an, I'm an academic advisor at the College of General Studies. I've been here for seven years now. Um, I'm also an alum of the program. So I was a, a CGS student and I finished the program in 2010. And then I completed my undergraduate degree in film and television studies uh, through the College of Communication in 2012, came back for more, and then completed my master's degree in uh, educational leadership and policy studies through Wheelock uh, in 2017. And I originally hail from Glenview, Illinois. Wonderful. Thanks, Matt. And we have uh, John Mackey, who is a professor of social science and also chair of social sciences. John, thank you. Uh, thank you, Natalie. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm John Mackey. I'm the chair of the social sciences division here at CGS. Uh, and I've been teaching courses in the social science division here. If, this is my 17th year uh, that I've been here. Um, and now as chair, I'm also working on overseeing uh, curriculum review uh, for the division. I'm originally from uh, Reading, Pennsylvania. Um, but I moved up to the Boston area to go to graduate school. I did my PhD at Boston College and I've been in New England ever since. Um, and it's uh, really nice to be here with you all and look forward to hearing your questions. Great, thank you, John. And we also have uh, an official from admissions, Rachel Boyle. Rachel? Hi everyone, thanks for having me. My name is Rachel Boyle. I'm an associate director uh, with BU Admissions. Just wanted to say congratulations to everybody. It was really fun reading your applications this winter. Um, I'm here to answer any admissions type questions you might have, but really you don't need me anymore. You've already been admitted to BU. So ask lots of questions and, and have fun. Thanks. Great, thanks, Rachel. And Nora Siddiqui, Nora's the student I was mentioning in my, my presentation who is pre-med, so Nora. Hello, everyone, I'm Nora Siddiqui. I'm a current senior in Sargent College of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences studying human physiology, um, like Dean McKnight said, on a pre-health track. I was also in the College of General Studies Boston London program and finished that in May of 2019. Um, and I'm really looking forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Noor. We have Anna uh, Oberfeld as well. Hi, everyone. I'm Anna. I'm a junior in the College of Arts and Sciences, and I'm double majoring in French and political science. So I already see some questions about majors and minors. Uh, I definitely have experience in that. Um, and I was in the CGS London program in 2020, and I'm super excited to answer your questions. Thank you, Anna. And Graham Rhodes. Hi everybody, my name is Graham. Um, I am from just north of Chicago in Wilmette, Illinois, so very close to Matt. Um, I'm majoring in international relations and minoring in sociology in the College of Arts and Sciences. And like Anna, I was also in CGS and I continued on from CGS in May of 2020. Um, and I also went to London, so uh, excited to meet you all. Great, Graham, thank you so much. And last but certainly not least, Megan Lau, who is also treasurer of our uh, student government at CGS. Hi everyone, my name is Megan Lau and I'm currently a sophomore in the College of General Studies, planning on majoring in business and minoring in political science. As Dean McKnight mentioned, I am in student government, so I'm 
happy to answer any questions that are related with that. And I'm originally from Los Angeles, California. Thank you, Megan. All right, so I'm opening up the questions here. And, and as Anna had said, with the first one I'm seeing is, are you still able to declare a minor or do a double major while in CGS? And when do those classes fit in? And the short answer is yes, but Anna, do you wanna take that? Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when I was in CGS and when you're in CGS, you will be able to take electives for your major and or minor at the same time you're taking CGS classes. Um, so I know for myself, I took some political science classes and also some French classes just to explore what my potential majors and minors would be. Um, and it's at the end of your sophomore year that you work with your advisor within CGS to officially declare that major uh, and or minor that you have. Um, but it's super seamless. I felt like I was in CGS, but also in the College of Arts and Sciences at the same time, since I was cl taking classes um, in both areas. Um, but definitely, if you are thinking of doing a ma uh, you are going to have a major, but if you're thinking of double majoring or having a minor, it's just super important to have those conversations with your academic advisor to make sure that you have a plan um, and that you know how you're going to get that done. Um, also making sure that you can have all your BU Hub requirements fulfilled as well. Um, I know personally for me, CGS was a super big advantage um, in being able to double major. I finished all my hub requirements practically when I was out of CGS. So now I'm just enjoying taking classes in my two majors. And I know for a lot of students who are in my position, they're still trying to catch up with the BU hub. And you know, I really have a head start because I did CGS and I'm still able to do my two majors. Awesome, thank you, Anna. Um, so this is a good, good advising question. I'm gonna steer this one to, to Dean Godnick. Have students had any difficulty with transferring credits from their time during the gap semester? That is a really great question, whoever asked it. Um, yeah, so no, I mean, basically, I mean, that you're, this is gonna be the repeated message that you'll be hearing uh, on us starting it off is, is it's really critical that you, you uh, review the credits that you want to take, the courses that you wanna take with your academic advisor. And here's the great news, everybody. You, um, as soon as you make your decision to come to BU, um, a few weeks after that, we give you a little time to graduate from high school, your CGS advisor reaches out to you. So your relationship with your advisor starts immediately. And that's when you start having those discussions about potential gap courses. Uh, what are the goals for taking them? And then you know their uh, eligibility for transfer. So if you confer with your advisor right away, uh, you'll be able to find the courses that will transfer. Great, thank you, Stacy. Uh, next question is, do all students go abroad freshman year or can they do it sophomore year? So uh, I'd say about 90 to 95% of our students do go to London for their second semester of their freshman year, but some stay here in Boston because some of them are international, so they're already abroad. And so going abroad seems kind of redundant. Um, so, so you don't have to go abroad, you could definitely stay here, and then you could be eligible to do any of the other, what is it, 90 some uh, study abroad programs that BU offers when there isn't a pandemic, which we're all hoping is we're emerging out of. Okay, I'm gonna scroll down here and see what else we have. If I live close enough to BU to commute, can I take a class or two at BU in the fall? Um, okay, this is also another good advising question. So I'm gonna steer this one to Matt Bay. It's a great question. So folks who are in the Boston area, um, short answer is yes, it is an option to take a uh, gap semester course or courses uh, through our Metropolitan College of BU. However, I do recommend, I th you're gonna, so first of all, you're gonna hear a big uh, common takeaway through a lot of these answers, which is talk to your advisor. Um, and, and the reason for that is, you know, for, for a lot of students, um, you really want to assess whether or not that is the best option for you to take a class at BU. Um, you know, there's a few advantages to taking courses externally. One, you know, if the school is a little bit closer to home, that's a big one. Um, and two, you know, the, the, it is worth mentioning that when you are uh, taking a gap semester course, you only have to earn a C or higher to get credit for that course and the grade doesn't transfer. So it is nice to kind of start uh, your semester with a, your, your college career, I should say, with a clean slate, so to speak. And what we want to avoid is a case where maybe you do uh, opt to take a, a metropolitan course class uh, and then you have the grade on your transcript. Maybe you don't want the grade on your transcript, et cetera. So it's a little bit more, um, you know, I think that, that overall that also allows the student to focus on the learning outcomes of, of the class they're taking in the gap semester. Um, 
suffice to say, that's my long-winded answer to yes, you can take a course through BU in the gap semester if you're local to the area or if you have a way to uh, uh, place to stay here, I should say. Um, but before you do anything, please uh, talk to your advisor. Yep, and that, that will be a common theme, but it bears repeating. So next question, uh, after CGS, do you get to choose the college you want to go to or do you have to go to the college that you originally applied for? You absolutely choose the college you wanna go on to and you are not stuck with the one you thought you first wanted at all. And that's one of the big advantages of, of CGS is because you get some time doing some general education courses, doing your, um, you know, taking some electives towards your perceived major. And then you don't have to decide until your sophomore year when you may have changed your mind and that's fine. I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in and say anything else, but. I just, I think from a, from a logistical perspective, I think it's helpful to know. And again, another great question is that if um, there's no limit to the number of spots uh, in the other schools and colleges. So if you come in thinking English and suddenly want to do film and TV in the college communication, two different schools, the college communication can say, no, you can't come. So it is, as, as Dean McKnight said, it is a, an expansive landscape for uh, your major options. You are in no way wedded to any one major when you come in, despite your intention when you started. Right, great. And, and here's another one I think probably a lot of people are, are interested in. Would you say it's still possible to achieve medical school from CGS as it is to go to medical school from CAS? The answer is absolutely yes. In fact, Dean Godnick has, um, I think, still is on the medical advisory board at BU. So she's working with students all the time who are preparing to go to medical school. And I don't know, Stacey, if you wanted to say yeah, I mean, you know, I see students from all different shapes and colors and backgrounds, different majors and different uh, different pathways to getting there. And, um, you know, from the College of General Studies, from the College of Engineering, you know, every there's so many pathways. And, you know, Noor has taken the pathway by going to Sargent College and majoring in human physiology. Other right. students take the pathway of doing biology. Some do English, you know, so it's, again, working with your advisor and exploring your goals and, and, and how you want to get there. Yep, yeah, great. And here's one I know many people are concerned about. What is the rooming situation considering we're coming in January? So um, so I'm going to let the students talk about what, what you know, um, how, how they were housed and how they picked a roommate or if they did or not. Uh, but, but definitely um, the students who start in January go through the same process as students who start in September. They fill out a housing survey, same survey, and uh, housing does its best to honor one of their top five choices. And then I think in all cases, they do honor that. So um, any of the students does want to jump in and answer that? Maybe I should pick because that makes it too long. No, I think Graham's going to go. Okay, great, great. <laughs> Um, so the, the housing, um, for me coming in January, um, I was really nervous cause I thought that coming in January, I would be placed in, um, a situation with somebody who has already been there for a while for like at the beginning of the semester, I had a lot of anxieties, but, um, the way that BU does the housing for CGS, uh, January students is, um, you are able to look at, um, all of the options on campus for you. Um, you actually do have additional options slash there is a little bit more of a possibility of you getting more varied housing. And what I mean by that is there's, there's kind of the typical freshman dorms that um, people know. So Warren, West, um, but being in CGS, you actually um, have the ability to get into what's considered typically like upperclassmen housing. So for me, I actually stayed in um, 575 Commonwealth or colloquially known as Hojo on campus, um, my freshman year. And that one was usually for um, sophomores and juniors. Um, the housing application, you fill it out, it pairs you with roommates. You can put a preference in for CGS roommates as well. Um, I didn't do that, but I know a lot of people who um, met other CGS students through Facebook and was able to room with them that way. Um, but I would agree that housing does a really good job of taking your preferences in and um, giving you the best, uh, the best option. Yeah, and sometimes students um, know someone who started in the fall and you can both request um, each other as roommates upon your entry in the spring. So housing does a really, their best job they can to accommodate um, roommate and housing requests. Yep. Anyone else wanna jump in on that one? 
Actually, Natalie, I could I could kind of say a word about that uh, from the faculty and residents perspective. Um, so uh, in addition to being on the faculty here at BU, I'm a faculty and residence. So that means my wife and I live here on campus. We live, uh, so I'm coming to you this morning from the 12th floor of Claflin Hall in West Campus. Um, and to kind of connect this to, I think I saw another question in the chat about getting to know people. You're coming in in January. Is it, what's it like to arrive and arrive on campus and arrive on a dorm in January as opposed to uh, September? And one of the great things about um, the residence life experience here at BU is that um, while there are all sorts of ways that new students are welcomed in September, um, there are also lots of ways that students are welcomed specifically in January. So there are special events and kind of get togethers. So weeks of welcome events uh, that go on. Uh, a lot of things this year, of course, were virtual, but normally in person. Um, so there's, there's a way that the, you know, the, for CGS students coming in, there's, there's kind of a great uh, celebration in January for, for the uh, arriving students. So um, that's, that's kind of another nice aspect of the residence life experience. Thanks, John. And, and that's a really key point because um, this does come up a lot. So remember when our students start in January, they're starting with a class of, of 600 other CBS students who are starting in January. So it's not like there's like 20 of them or something. There's all a big group. You know, it's, a, it's the size of a small private liberal arts college itself. Um, so, so they have a lot of peers that are starting in January with them, which is, and, and there are other uh, students at BU outside of CGS who are also starting in January, which is why the uh, Dean of Students Office does offer a lot of programming in January uh, because it's just another start date, uh, um, like Splash, where you can find out about all the clubs and activities at BU and, and join right in them. So really they, they aren't missing out on anything. They're starting with a big cohort and then they're in this team system, which really gets them, uh, you know, allows them to get to know each other really well too. So uh, we have found in fact, that since we started this uh, January freshman program, uh, our students seem to be even more active in student government than they ever were before. And we've had multiple groups of students who, who come in like Megan Lau, who's on the executive board, uh, who's with us today, executive board of our student government. Many of them come in and they just hit the ground running in January. They get very involved in student government, then they're officers the next year in their sophomore year, like Megan is. And then many of them have gone on to be officers in, in BU-wide student government as well. So um, they, don't see, they don't waste any time and they don't seem to be behind at all. If anything, they seem to kind of jumpstart. So, um, so there was a question about uh, this program offers a lot of room to explore your interests while completing BU Hub requirements. Given that the track is exploratory, is it realistic and valuable for somebody who knows what they want to do and wants to hit the ground running? Uh, I, I would say yes, very much so. I think Noor, and I'll let her say this, I think Noor is somebody who knew exactly what she wanted to do, but correct me if I'm wrong, Noor, and, and, but also benefited from um, the CGS program because you know the team system, the, the quality of learning, that style of learning, and also the fact that we're, we're a really efficient way to take care of those universal BU hub requirements so that you can really just focus on your major in your last two years. So whether you don't know what you wanna do or you really know what you wanna do, it still pays off. Nora, do you wanna say anything about that? Yeah, of course. So like Dean McKnight said, I did um, come into undergrad knowing exactly what I wanted to do. And the CGS program actually helped me tremendously because it allowed me to focus in on my interests, but it also broadened my horizons to so many things that I wouldn't have given myself the grace to be able to go and explore and really be interested in. And at the same time, another area that it really helped me with was getting all of those general education requirements done. And so because I was able to do that, it made my junior and senior years at BU um, able to be so much more focused in on my major classes, which made those, in my opinion, so much more beneficial official because I didn't have to worry about trying to scramble to get a general writing credit or um, history class or something like that in. And so it, um, I feel like it almost benefited me being in the College of General Studies, but also knowing exactly what I wanted to do um, with my time here at BU. Thanks, Nora. And I know Anit said something similar too. So, um, uh, so next question, are students able to study abroad again at BU after the summer semester? Absolutely. Uh, so because of our summer semester in London and, and the students just love it, many have gone on to do a second and some even a third study abroad uh, in their four years at BU. So this is one of the 
big advantages of doing study abroad early. Um, I myself did a study abroad, but it was in the junior year, which is typical. And then you come back and then it's your senior year and you don't really have any more time. So, so I did one and it was great and I loved it. There was no way I could have done three if you start in your junior year. But if you start in your freshman year, you can do three. So um, yeah, it opens up a lot of opportunities. And here's another one. Maybe all the students can weigh in on this one. What did you guys do during your gap semester? Oh, maybe uh, I should so during my gap. Yeah. Go ahead, Nora, thanks. <laughs> okay, great. During my gap semester, I took that time to work and save up money for not only the Boston semester um, here starting in January, but also London. And um, it was a it's such a nice reset, like Dean McKnight has mentioned, to not have to worry about classes or school or homework. And so it really did make me so much more excited to come and start school in January. And I believe it truly made me a lot more focused um, in on those classes. Great. Anna, do you want to say a few words about what you did? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm from Colorado and I did an internship with my uh, senator, Senator Bennett, um, which was an amazing opportunity because a lot of people um, don't get an internship right out of high school, especially um, in a field they're interested in. So I was really lucky. Um, I have this internship on my resume. I had a great experience and I also was able to devote a lot more time to that internship. Um, and I also took classes at a community college for French, which was extremely helpful for me because I didn't even know at the time that I was going to study French at BU. Um, it was just kind of an interest class and that also just propelled me on the path to being a French major at BU. And also really gave me a head start because I was able to skip a lot of classes um, in my French major because I took that community uh, college class. Um, but yeah, I agree with Noor. It was really helpful for me. I was feeling really burnt out after high school and just working so hard and doing all the applications um, that it was a really good moment for me to reset and just focus on what my interests were before going into BU. Great. And, and so you're one of the people I was describing who did an internship, some classes towards the major and a study abroad. And that's just your first year. That's pretty amazing. And, and Graham, and then Megan, if you wanna weigh in on what you did in the gap. Sure, um, so I went into my gap semester planning to just work and take a, uh, a class at a community college and keep it very low key because uh, like Nora and Anna, I was also very burnt out from high school. Um, but, uh, and I did do that. I continued my job from the summer working at an ice cream shop just uh, to raise some money for college. Um, but I also had the opportunity to explore a lot of creative projects. So I was able to um, do work on a couple photo shoots, which was crazy. Um, I'm a makeup artist, so that's that was my forte. And I got to really practice that skill in like a, a really cool environment. I definitely would have not been able to do that if I didn't have my gap semester. Um, and I was able to kind of not have to sacrifice any part of what I wanted to do for school, if that makes sense. It was just this wonderful exploratory uh, opportunity where I was literally to, uh, able to do um, whatever my heart desired. I also did travel for a little bit because um, in September, October, it's kind of like off travel season. So you can get some like cheaper deals on, on stuff like that. Um, so I, I truly uh, was able to do a lot. Great, wonderful. And Megan? Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. My gap semester experience was actually really similar to Anna's. Um, I also interned with a number of like the House of Representatives from my city, which was a great experience for me to kind of get that firsthand knowledge into what the inner workings of like a political office, which was really interesting. I also, at the time, wasn't sure what I wanted to major in. So I spoke to my advisor, Matt, who was also on this call. And we just discussed and tried to like plan out um, my schedule. So I ended up taking a course at a local community college as well. And then just to put, tie everything together, I volunteered for my local parade, which occurred on like New Year's Day. So that was really fun to kind of um, meet with different members of my community. But overall, I would say for me, it was like a transformational experience. It was really nice to just kind of take a nice little breather between high school and the beginning of college. Hey, you know, Dean McKnight, there's another sort of corollary question. Was it hard to to start um, in the spring when all your friends were starting uh, in, in the fall? Yeah, so so let's just do the same round and in the same order so you don't feel like you're, you're jumping on each other, starting with Noor. 
All right, great. So um, I completely understand where people come from with that nervousness of starting in um, the spring, obviously, because you don't want FOMO, which is fear of missing out from what all of your peers are doing starting in the fall. Um, but actually, um, what's so great about it is that even though you might be starting a semester later than your peers are, you get to go to London right after that, which is something that most of your other peers don't get that opportunity to do which just opens up so many doors for you. Um, and Dean McKnight mentioned this as well, but there's 600 other students starting with you in January. And so it really just creates the best community because everybody's coming in and really trying to make the most out of their time here because they know that um, some students have already started in the fall and they're starting in the spring. And so I feel like it makes everybody a lot more intentional with their relationships and everything that they decide to do um, during their first semester. Great, thank you. Anana. I completely agree. It was actually super easy for me to make friends uh, when I came on campus in the spring, uh, way easier than I expected. I think by that point, a lot of CGS students are, you know, super excited to start their college experience. Everyone comes in with a really positive outlook and they're looking to meet a lot of people and make a lot of friends. Um, so even my first orientation at BU, um, I made my best friend at college and we're still best friends. We've been roommates for a long time. Um, and it was also really easy to make friends through my classes. And that is the amazing part of the team system at CGS. You have um, the same classes with the same people. You have the same professors. It's so easy to make study groups to, you know, help each other out on assignments. And through that, um, I really made a, a tight knit uh, group of friends. Um, and then London, I think, is a further bonding experience. Um, I think that I'm like extremely bonded with my friends from London. Um, but at the same time, because I was taking classes outside of CGS as well, I was already making friends outside of my major. Um, so it was really great because I had friends um, in CGS who were studying a variety of things like health science and English, which, you know, aren't my forte, but I also had friends um, in my major. Great. And Graham? Yeah, I mean, same thing here. At, at the end of my gap semester, I was so eager to just like get at it and be social and make friends. So I joined like five clubs at the very beginning and um, I'm still a part of most of them actually. <laughs> but um, the energy when you're coming in in, in January is, is truly unique because it's not just you who wants to go out and make all these friends. It's the 599 other students in your program who want to do that too. And everybody's just looking to be friends and make connections. Um, I did a lot of connecting um, online before the gap semester. So when I got to campus, um, I was able to hang out with some people and get to know people um, in person, which was really cool. And yeah, the transition was um, much easier than expected in that regard. Thank you, Graham and Megan. Just going off of what Graham said about connecting prior to getting to BU, something that I noticed that I did myself and other people in my class was that we had really strong group chats and they were very active during the gap semesters to keep everyone really connected. And I found that people that were living in certain areas, so like for me, I live in the Los Angeles area, I met up with a couple of other CGS students over the gap semester who are also in from the Los Angeles area just to get to know people that way. And then of course, when you get to Boston in January, there's so many people who are willing to, you know, just say, introduce themselves and just say hello. And one other thing to add, I think is that with the electives that you take on um, your freshman spring semester, it's always nice to know that there are also other CGS students in that class as well. So you can form little study groups and there are already people that you know in a class that might, um, might have more people just because it's like a prerequisite class. Great, thank you. Awesome answers, everybody. So there are a couple questions I'm gonna to try to collapse together here. Um, are there freshman orientations in January for CGS students? Absolutely there are. So don't worry about that, got you covered there. Um, and then several questions about COVID-19 and this semester in London. Uh, so sadly, we were not able to go to London in summer 2020. Uh, the entire university went fully remote. So we had to do that semester remote. And, and Megan uh, experienced that. Uh, this summer, we were hoping we'd be able to go, but on March 1st, the declaration was made that uh, Study Abroad would not be running any of its programs uh, this summer because the pandemic is still with us and not enough people are vaccinated. However, the plan is that uh, by fall, most of us should have been vaccinated, right? And we're planning to be 
back to as close to normal as you can get here at BU, which means summer 22, which is when this incoming group of freshmen would be going to London, we should be fine. And yes, I'm knocking on wood because that's what I do about every five minutes for the last year and a month. Um, but, but honestly, with the vaccines rolling out, uh, and, and granted they've been slow, but even by, by September, I think, uh, the majority of the community will be vaccinated and that will change everything. And that's happening, of course, in London and England in general, of course. So um, do many students travel within Europe during the London semester? Oh yes, and how? Uh, do, do you guys who went to London want to weigh in on that? Did you travel much? Yeah, so I traveled actually after my London session, which I would I would highly recommend if you want to travel, travel before or after uh, you complete this uh, six weeks. Um, and so I traveled to Paris afterwards with a few friends. It was an amazing experience. Um, and but I do know people who did travel on the weekends uh, during the London program as well. Um, I think for me personally, um, London is a great experience, but it is still an academic experience and it is challenging since you have a whole semester in six weeks. Um, and so that's why it was really important for me to, you know, kind of as a treat of the end of my six weeks in London, take that vacation and travel then so I could really enjoy my time traveling. Great. I don't know, Nora, Graham, do you want to weigh in? Did you travel at all? I would also just want to weigh in on the student activities office that's in BU London that they also um, set, or they put together trips for like Wales and I think Scotland might be also on there if I remember correctly and so those are trips that are pre-planned through that office that are also great opportunities for um, you guys as um, London students to look into and then I personally didn't travel during the weekend just because I wanted to be able to see as much of London as possible in the six weeks that I was there but I did have friends that would go on weekend trips um, and it was nice because we didn't have class on Mondays. And so they were able to spread out um, their trip just a little bit more. Great, thank you. Uh, there are several questions about London. I'll try to collapse some of them. Um, housing and meals in a London semester. So we have our, we own our own um, campus in London, which has its own dormitories and students are housed in the dorms. So, and, and they're beautiful, they're wonderful. And then some of the dorms actually have some of the classrooms in them. And then there's a main academic building as well. We do not have a meal plan in London. There's no cafeteria. So, so but the dorms have kitchens at the end of the hall and students uh, get to practice their cooking skills or develop cooking skills if they've never developed them before. And, and, and that's, that's been fun for, for students. It brings them together as a group. I've, we've had groups of students who, um, who, who invite their faculty over for dinner. So it's a nice communal experience. And there are several um, grocery stores in easy walking distance of our main dormitory. So, it, so that's easy enough. Um, and it's six weeks. This semester in London is six weeks. Um, summer one and summer two. We run two different semesters. They're each six weeks. I'm gonna. We have. There's a question about the capstone project, and um, so I'd like to have uh, John Mackey say a little bit about some of the topics he's seeing this year, and maybe um, uh, a couple of the students can weigh in on what they did. John. Sure, I'd be happy to. Capstone is really one of the most exciting and innovative and um, rewarding parts of the CGS curriculum, I think, and our students are in it right now. So um, my colleagues and I are working with our students. We have groups doing a number of really interesting projects. One group is working on um, race and medicine and dealing with uh, inequities in COVID treatment and vaccines. Another group is working on a project related to the ambiguous political status of Puerto Rico, um, part of the United States, yet not meaningfully represented in the federal government. Um, we've got another group working on uh, big data and uh, 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 digital privacy issues, right? So we've got uh, groups working on a whole series of projects um, tackling real world problems and coming up with solutions. Um, so I, I think it's, it's, it's probably one of the most challenging parts of our curriculum for faculty and students actually. Um, but one of the most rewarding for sure. And yeah, I'd love to hear from the from the students if you have thoughts on your capstone experience too. Yeah, let's hear from one who, who's done it and, and Megan who's in it right now. So Nora, you wanna say what you did? Yes, of course. So I did a social science-based capstone and mine was um, the nuclear missile crisis going on in North Korea. 
And doing Capstone was one of the best experiences that I've had at BU as a whole. And it's also something that I continuously bring up in any interview experience that I have, because a lot of interview questions ask about times that you've worked in a team or worked with people that you might not already be close with. And in every experience that I've had bringing up Capstone, um, every interviewer is very impressed with it and really um, they wanna know as much as possible about it. And so it's a great experience, not only academically, but also professionally. Great. And Megan, you were just saying about your capstone experience so far. How's it going? Yeah, it's going well so far. I think we're on week two. So my group, uh, we are currently working on the use of forensic science and law enforcement. So we're still currently in the research phase of things. But since CGS classes, sophomore year, spring, and at the, in the end of March, we, at this point in time, are just meeting with our entire team of professors. And of course, right now, it's remotely over Zoom but we just have these weekly meetings with them to go over what we've researched and to ask any questions we've had. But so far it's been a really great and informative experience and I'm looking forward to putting together the research paper and the presentation in a few more weeks. And good luck, I, mean, I know you'll be great. Um, so I'm gonna take one more question and then just uh, you know, let you know about some additional resources that you might wanna check out. So there's a question about the first year curriculum and when the students, uh, touch base with the advisor to help pick electives in the freshman year. So, so Dean Godnick, do you wanna say something about that, please? Sure, it's a good question. Uh, so what happens is, is the advisor and you begin your relationship uh, end of May, June, and that's when you start talking about, well, we start to get to know you and um, you get to know us and we start talking about your goals um, and developing some goals if you don't have any clear ones and talking about what you're going to be, how you'll curate your gap semester. Graham and I work together on that. And then um, in September, October, we start talking about course selection for the spring semester and whether you'll take one elective, two electives, and we start reviewing the pathways. Well, actually, we might have done that even sooner. So the relationship really does start at the end of May, beginning of June, and it then proceeds throughout the summer uh, and through the fall. Great, thank you, Dean Godnick. So um, I think that's taken care of our questions, but if you have additional questions, please feel free to email us at cgs at bu.edu, cgs at bu.edu. And also feel free to join us for another Q&A if you want, we're doing two of these. Uh, for the next, uh, well, today, we're doing another one at three, and then we're doing two more next Friday and two more the Friday after that, and one Saturday, April 16th as well. And, and you can sign up for those in the Admitted Students site. There's also other wonderful resources at Admitted Students uh, site that you, you might want to check out. And we have some fantastic chats with students, since I think our students are our, our best spokespeople. So we've got four different chats. You can sign up uh, with students in April uh, the 6th, 13th, 22nd, and 27th, and check those out on the admitted students page as well. I wanna thank our wonderful panelists. You guys were amazing. You didn't even need me here at all, but um, I was happy to share the hour with you. Thank you for everyone who's joining us out there in the virtual land. Um, <laughs> and I, I hope we answered your questions. Good luck through this process. Congratulations again. Uh, it's an amazing accomplishment and, and uh, best wishes. Take care. Thank Take care, all. everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.